disclaimer, this episode contains a couple instances of strong language. I am delighted to have two talented authors here today. Daniel Abraham and Ty Frank wrote a series of books under the pen name of James S.A. Corey. Those books, of which there are nine complete novels plus several short stories and novellas, make up the body of work known as The Expanse. Fans of the book and TV series are quick to note just how good the depictions of science and technology are, and how closely the political and social issues addressed dovetail with issues facing Earth today. The Expanse won the Hugo Award for Best Series in 2020, and I'm delighted to speak with the two people who've brought so much gravitas and storytelling skill to sci-fi as of late. So thank you so much for coming on the show, Ty and Dan. Uh, thank you for having us. Dan, uh, Daniel is the one who's in charge of Gravitas. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. We'll give him all the hard questions. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just, lower your expectations and we'll be fine. It's um, those of us in science are used to that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just want to start off by by mentioning to everybody who listens, um, writing novels is a tricky endeavor on its own. Um, and writing a series of well-researched and plotted sci-fi books uh, with two authors over the course of 10 years is on another level. So, and feel free, either of you, to answer any of these questions, but what sparked your drive to see the series come to life, and how did you navigate that juggling of two creative minds um, to make things work? <laughs> this is, this is not as funny an answer as you're hoping for. That The answer is... Daniel said, hey, do you want to write a book with me? And I was like, okay. Yeah. And then we did. Much, yeah. No, that was... <laughs> and then we did. And then a couple of years later, he's like, you want to write six more? And I was like, okay. And, and then yeah. we did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it was. <laughs> it, it's one of those things. Where I don't think we understood what we were doing when we started, or we might not have actually done it. There was a, it was, it was, it was really, uh, started off as this kind of awesome tabletop role-playing game that Ty was running. And, uh, I thought, look, he, he's already done all the hard part. He's done all the, the homework. Um, I could just write this down. We could sell it for pizza money. Uh, and that's, yeah, that's, there's the origin story. Pizza. Well, okay. Pizza, but, and you know, pizza and gaming, that is something that I think a lot of us can relate to. <laughs> Um, but your pizza and gaming has clearly produced something a little bit more uh, intricate than many of our uh, efforts we, in that space go to. We, we overachieved. Did. We did overshoot. Yeah. <laughs> so then how I, I, I read it somewhere online um, that you two split it up um, by writing different character focused chapters. Like, is, is so that's how you deepen that relationship with the book? Some, sometimes. So the first book. Um, was very formal. It's, I, I wrote half of the chapters from one uh, POV and he wrote half the chapters from the other POV. And then even into the second book, we were still, I think, mostly doing that where I wrote two of the POVs and he wrote the other two. But by the time we got to the third and fourth books, it had gotten a little looser. And by the time we got to the end, um, it had it was a free-for-all. It, it, it started out that way um, but as time went on, you know, so there were certain characters I knew how to write. There were certain characters Daniel knew how to write. But after five or six books of writing these characters and editing each other's work and all that stuff, that was no longer true. You know, he he could write a Holden chapter, no problem. You know, I could write a whatever chapter. Um, so it stopped being broken up by which characters do we know how to write? And it started being broken up by which chapter is interesting to me. So Daniel has a certain kind of chapter that he likes to write, irrespective of the POV that he's writing it from. And I have a certain kind of chapter I like to write, irrespective of the POV. So we started breaking up that way. And then when we were producing the TV show, um, I was, most of the time I was the on, on set producer or, or in the writing, writing room the whole time. Because uh, my wife was in England getting her PhD and I don't have kids. And Daniel's wife was at home and his kid was at home. So he preferred to be there. So for there was several years there where the lion's share of the first draft writing was falling on him because I was rewriting scripts and producing on set and that sort of stuff. So he would he would do a lot of the first draft stuff and then I would do the first pass revision and that's how the co-writing went. So it was, it by the end it got very messy. It it really helps in a a uh, 
a collaboration like this for each person to kind of feel like the other guy's doing more of the work. If we just we'll both feel a little bit guilty about how much the other guy has to do, much smoother. <laughs> That's great. I love it. And I think that actually um, tracks with how a lot of scientific work uh, is produced. You have co-authors and whatnot, and it's like, uh-oh, this person's doing too much, especially if it's a grad student. Uh, <laughs> then then you feel a little bit more motivated, I think. Um, but that is actually super interesting. So it's a true collaboration, like many great things in life. And um, I just, before we dive into a little bit more of the specifics of The Expanse, I just, I've been wondering you know, we have so much exploration and scientific research and problems that we need to address here on Earth. So what drew you to to writing about exploration in space? This one's you, man. <laughs> I, I, yeah, this was all um, done by the time I showed up. It, tackling tackling real life problems in fiction. Um, I mean, it, it happens. It always happens, no matter what you're writing about the time that you live in, even if you're writing about the far future. So the things that concern us today are definitely going to show up in the fiction, no matter what time the fiction is set. But I get bored easily about like, I don't, I don't want to write a, a hundred thousand word tract on why global warming is bad. Um, that, that would like, it's true, but it, it would bore me to write that. Um, so for me, the things that keep me interested are uh, the new things, the unexpected things, the things we haven't seen or heard of before. Um, and, and having the characters run into things that they have no frame of reference for and have to struggle to figure out, that's what keeps me interested. Um, and space is full of mystery. I mean, and, and you could make an argument that the earth still has a lot of mystery here too, you know, uh, but I didn't want to write a story about deep sea divers. So <laughs> it's either, either you're going to the bottom of the ocean or you're going out into space if you want to find stuff we haven't seen before. Uh, and, and the other thing that I think Ty brought to this that was really useful was a sense of history um, and a sense of the way that the issues that we're seeing now and that we expect to see in the future recapitulate and rhyme with the things we've seen in the past. Um, the We get we get a certain amount of credit for um, kind of prescience about things because we're actually writing about stuff that happened a hundred years ago or a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. Um, and it just turns out there are certain evergreen issues that show up in humans. <laughs> the, the Daniel's saying the nice version, the, the, <laughs> the not nice version is humans do the same dumb <laughs> over and over and over again. So if you write about some dumb stuff, somebody did 2000 years ago, I guarantee somebody's doing it today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, if you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to repeat it. And oh, uh, we're and doomed to repeat it anyway. We do it anyway. <laughs> Yeah, if this you if you learn accurate. from the past, you are doomed to watch other people around you repeat it. It's just it, yeah. yes, yeah. It's a it's a curse as well as a blessing to um, have that perspective. I think, and so for for I'm assuming a lot of our listeners have probably been exposed to your work in some form because you know it is very scientist friendly. Um, but for folks who don't know, uh, the world of the expanse is set in a future where humans have colonized the solar system. So the UN uh, is the governing mechanism on Earth, and it's the wealthiest and most secure region. The moon is a pretty functional outpost for shipping and transport and government function. Mars is a military power, and Mars itself is being terraformed. Uh, and the asteroid belt is basically populated with um, a lot of working class people who their bodies have actually physically changed because they've had generations born in uh, low gravity. So the social order is extremely stratified. And it seems really logical when you put it in the historical context. So um, when you set out to to do this, um, I, I'm going to direct this one at Ty, I think, is what I what I should do here. Um, how did you conceive of this setup? I mean, was it instant, like, oh, this is how colonization of space would work? No, it, it was actually much more functional than that. So the original pitch for The Expanse, uh, a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, uh, my uncle is a bigwig at this Chinese uh, internet service provider, and they want to develop their own in-house MMORPG. And if you don't know what that is, the massively multiplayer online RPGs like World of Warcraft. They wanted to develop an in-house MMO that they could host on their uh, internet service providing platform and attract people to use their service. This was for China, in China. 
And she said, uh, you know about games and do you, do you have an idea? Is there something we could pitch him as an idea for a game? So I, I sort of put together some loose notes that I had and came up with a pitch that is what The Expanse is. And the reasons for all these things are very functional. Uh, you know, World of Warcraft has two factions. You can be the Alliance or the Horde and they're fighting each other. And I was like, well, we'll be better. We'll have three. So we'll have Earth, Mars, and the Belt will be the three factions. And then once I had come up with that, then I had to come up with reason, why are they fighting each other? So Earth is like sort of the, the decaying empire. It's like the, the British empire in, in the last couple centuries where, you know, at one point it was the most massive empire on Earth and then it begins to retract and lose its, its status. And that's, where, that's Earth. It's the decaying empire. And then Mars is, you know, like the, the United States, it's the breakaway power that suddenly is superseding its former uh, home. You know, uh, suddenly uh, it's the most powerful military and, 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 you know, becoming the dominant military force. And then, and then the third, I wanted sort of that sort of like messy anarchist kind of feel. And, and the thing that, you know, that Daniel talks about looking at history, the thing that has been, always been true is when you want cheap material extraction, when you want to dig up rare earth in Africa. Yes, you can use expensive machines to do that, but 12-year-olds are cheaper. So you go and you just get a bunch of 12-year-olds to crawl down the holes and dig things up. Um, and so this idea that the, you know, the mineral extraction from this belt would be all super advanced robots just didn't feel true to me. What felt true to me is the minute that we can just take a bunch of poor people and ship them out there, that's what we're going to do because that's what we have always done. And so you wind up with sort of the oppressed underclass of workers, basically miners in space, um, who are being misused by these two superpowers uh, to, for mineral extraction. And that's kind of where the idea came from. Yeah, humans are pretty good at being consistent about exploiting resources <laughs> and people. <Yeah. laughs> so um, I, I found that actually um, what really jumped out at me when I started watching, I started with the TV series and it was because um, some friends had said, oh, Jess, like you're such a science nerd. You'd love this. And I'm like, I'm hard to drag into TV series. Uh, it's I'm much more of a book person by nature. And uh, I think it took me by the fourth episode. I was like, this is amazing. So <laughs> and then I went and read the books. So it was it was sort of a reverse of how I usually uh, come to, to media. But I think that um, what really resonates with the series, uh, both the books and the TV show, were the like the fundamental undergirding of the humanity behind all of this. Like, yeah, we're in the future and we have all these really amazing technologies and we're being confronted by challenges that don't exist on Earth as well as ones that do. Um, but the humans are the real binding glue that holds the, the series together. And so this is, you know, like I said, it's a futuristic space opera, um, at, but much of the conflicts do play out like they do on Earth. So you get conflicts between governments and what they prioritize, between the oppressed people, et cetera, et cetera. But unlike sci-fi series like Star Trek, um, like the conflict, the poverty, the suffering, they're very standard. I mean, that in the expanse, that just happens. Um, but the solutions to the crises seem to be mostly solved by people talking to each other. <laughs> and uh, so, so what led you to doing, to approaching it that way of, of this isn't idealized, this is actually more realistic, even with some more fantastic elements uh, sprinkled throughout? I mean, I answered the last one. Okay, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> well, I think, I think when you're doing something like this, um, it's necessarily a reflection of the opinions of the 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 people who are doing it. And I think Ty and I both Ty and I came from very different backgrounds. We came up very differently and we came to some very similar conclusions about humans and how they work and how realistic it is to uh double down on you know murdering your way to a better tomorrow. Um and the the kind of necessity of um compassion and of respect and of learning your way out of trouble instead of uh, murdering your way out of trouble. And it, it, I mean, it wasn't something we, we specifically discussed, 
it wasn't something we were saying, you know, well, what are the themes we're going to try to, you know, it's just, this is, this is the conversation that we have with ourselves and with each other. And that's what winds up being reflected in the books and the series. Yeah. And I, I, I appreciate utopian futures. I, I appreciate them as aspirational. Like, you know, you watch Star Trek and every, there are no poor people in Star Trek you know, in, at least in, in the Federation, you know, it's, everybody is a spaceship captain and everybody has an awesome job. And, um, and, and, you know, at, as even as a kid watching those shows, like it, while I appreciated them, I was like, who, who mops the floors on the enterprise? Who does that job? Who, who mucks out the space toilet when it gets plugged, you know? Uh, I, and you never see that person. And then um, in the seventies, in the late seventies, a movie called alien came out. Uh, Ridley Scott's masterpiece and I saw for the first time the guys I had always been wondering about because you had Parker and Brett guys in coveralls with tool belts and they were mad because they didn't pay as much as the other and it wasn't like we're all noble square jawed space heroes it was like we're truckers in space and we're getting screwed because the the people up in the bridge get paid more than us and we want you know we don't get as much bonus as they do and they're mad about it and they're complaining and I was like this, this is the fiction I want to see it, because it felt real to me in a way that Star Trek never did. Um, and I appreciate the aspiration of Star Trek, but I, you know, and it would be awesome if humans could figure out a way to do that. But I feel like the future is going to be, you know, uh, the, the, I, I was, you know, talk, when I talk about this, I was talking about like the first people to cross the oceans were like explorers and adventurers and, and sea captains and all that stuff, right? The next people to cross the oceans were merchant marines. And they were just, they were, you know, using wrenches on boilers and complaining about their paychecks and covered in grease. Um, and you never get to see that second wave in science fiction. You never get to see the grease covered wrench guys. You always see the brave space captains. And I, I like that second part. Yeah, I think that really does track with, with um, I hadn't articulated it, but I think that's what I was seeing too, because I love Star Trek. Um, yeah. And it's, I mean, it's its such an idealized future. I, I hope we get there someday. <laughs> but yeah, I think we're probably going to go a lot closer to the way of the expanse uh, you know, for quite a while. There's, there's this there's this whole idea about like transhumanism and, and the, the idea of what happens when humanity evolves to its next, I mean, we, we kind of, pass over what evolution actually, you know, requires as far as killing a bunch of people before they reproduce. But, but the idea of um, transcending humanity to something better and, and uploading your brain or, you know, whatever. Uh, I've always thought the, the real transhuman moment would be uh, when we stopped judging our worth relative to the guy who lives next to us. That's going to be when we're not human anymore. That's going to be when we become something different. And as long as we're doing that, I think we're going to wind up doing the same stuff we've been doing. That's fair. <laughs> so, so just shifting tracks just a tiny bit. Um, now, before we started recording, you know, you both mentioned to me, you're not scientists. That's okay. We love non-scientists here at UCS. Uh, <laughs> so that does beg the question, of course, uh, like, how did you get the science right? Because, and I want to just highlight this for folks who maybe haven't read or watched yet but in the books and the tv series it is stunning the amount of scientific detail that goes into the actual finished products um space physics materials um and one of my favorite things is when you see the way blood or other liquids behaves in zero gravity environments um or low gravity environments or um like when you're in space, you have people working in space doing like space walks or you have um, fighting occurring in space. Uh, the, the space is shown as a vacuum. It is shown correctly. Um, and you don't you don't have like little pew pew noises the same way that you, you would in some other uh, sci fi properties. So without being scientists, um, how on earth did you get the science right at such granular levels? Uh, well, we actually do have sound in space. <laughs> um, I mean, totally. that, on the on the show, um, so we you know that we don't we're not a hundred percent aiming for accuracy. But uh, Daniel always jokes that you know we the fact that people see us as hard sci fi or more accurate than other sci fi is a little shocking because we we only ever aim for what Daniel calls Wikipedia level plausibility. <laughs> 
Um, and and it turns out, um, and Daniel's talked about this a bunch on other things, uh, so I'll talk for him. It turns out that being seen as unusually rigorous is very easy. All you have to do is have light speed still be the rule and have gravity the work the way gravity actually works. That's it. That's all we did that was radically different. You know, our spaceships don't have magical gravity plating or, you know, that, that, that the ships aren't built like ocean liners, even though the thrust is coming from the back and everybody would be pinned to the back wall the entire time. Um, even just that, people go, oh, wow, that's so weird. That's so unusual. Um, and the fact that if you're trying to call your buddy, you know, uh, on a moon of Jupiter, it's going to take a couple hours for your call to get there. It's not instantaneous communication and even just those little things just little things like that people saw that and go wow that's so unusual because historically those are inconveniences for plotting and so people just hand wave them away um it, it's it's i don't want to have to deal with that from a plot perspective so i'm just going to pretend like we invented the you know xyz hyper mega device and now we have instantaneous communication and gravity wherever we want it and now i don't have to deal with that there's, there's, there's another thing though. There's, I mean, um, you know, we're, we're not, we're not scientists. Um, I have a, like a bachelor's degree in, in biology, but I, you know, my career was, was tech support before I did this. So, eh. um, and, but, but there's a level of, um, excitement about and interest in, uh, the way the world works that Ty and I both kind of had before we came to this. Um, when you start talking about, you know, why is Ganymede uh, the breadbasket? Well, because it has the the uh, magnetosphere. I, you know, we know that because Ty uh, was interested in that when he was growing up, and he read a bunch of stuff, and he he uh, learned a bunch of stuff just for the joy of knowing things. Um, you know, I I was a biology major because uh the cute girl was taking biology and i wanted to sit next to her and and then and then i did four years of that um but that informs how i how i move through the world ever after that and 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 i wound up really enjoying things like thinking about evolution and genetics and you know it's not something i do professionally except to the degree that we're we're making it up um but there is a joy in being educated. There is a joy in knowing stuff and exploring stuff. And uh, there's not actually a lot of of homework we needed to do for the series because we built the series out of the things that we already knew and were enthusiastic about. You took the old adage of write what you know to heart, but just what you know is like an amazing mishmash of knowledge that you've picked up with then the ability to project it out forward uh, into the future. Well, and, so. you know, and you read some bunch of, of Stephen Jay Gould and, and Lewis Thomas, and, and turns out you can make up a pretty interesting uh, alien world. Yeah, it's just that there, easy. There were a few times that we got to the edges of what we knew and, and called in a little help. Um, I, I don't know if you know Phil Plate, but Phil Plate, I reached out to him and asked him for some help on, uh, I wanted to know exactly what it would look like when a neutron star collapsed into a black hole. What, what, what exactly what would be happening physics wise and radiation wise and all those sorts of things. I didn't know that. Um, and he helped me out with that. Um, there'd be a few other times we got to the edge of things we knew and we'd you know, reach out to somebody and go, Hey, what would it look like if this happened? Daniel solved a very complex physics problem uh, by calling in some, some scientists to help him figure it out. Um, so, you know, that we did, we did occasionally need a little extra help, but we tended not to write about stuff that was beyond the things we already knew. We, we tended to stay in our, our comfort zone generally. I do know Phil and he is the perfect person to ask about your neutron <laughs> star uh, questions. And if you ever need volcano help, you know who to call. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah. So write something involving volcanoes and I'm all over it. Um, but uh, so that, that kind of makes me want to know out of all of the, you know, the creativity that went into this massive series, um, each of you individually, what is your favorite technology from what you wrote um, that you hadn't come across in other sci-fi 
Oh Lord, there's so much stuff in other sci-fi uh, though. A tri- tri- trivial cure for cancer. Yeah, trivial cure. <laughs> well, it's like seriously. Uh, oh, I have cancer, so I'll just take this pill, and now I don't have cancer. One one of the things that we did when we were doing that first book was we said, okay, what are the th- problems we have to have solved in order for this to be even vaguely plausible? What what what, what do we need to to be able to do for sure in order to have a uh, viable spacefaring humanity and yeah solving cancer was actually like the thing it was like okay we're going to be sucking down amazing amounts of radiation um how do we not just die so mm-hmm. that was that was a good one and it wound up actually fitting into the plot later on and the fun thing i didn't know this um so we we have that uh that technology fit in in book four um one of our characters because he is on this kind of anti-cancer regimen um winds up not being uh affected by an alien parasite and our biologist is like oh that means there's some kind of convergent evolution on a molecular level that's amazing and we know we wrote that because it was fun and then like two years ago somebody found evidence of uh there being a, a good move in design space on a molecular level where things were, there was convergent evolution down there. We, we got to guess right. That was awesome. So it's intelligent guesswork when it happens. Absolutely. <laughs> now you make a thousand guesses and one of them's right. And then you take credit for it. Yeah. Yeah. And then you no, look, we don't you talk look about, we don't talk smart. about, we don't talk about how disappointing it was to find out that series was covered in ice. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. I think a lot of us were disappointed there. Yeah. Well. <laughs> well, that's that's actually pretty interesting. I love it that it's like we're talking about something in space and yet cancer, something that a lot of us have to deal with here on Earth today is one of the major things you had to just, OK, we need to solve this. Um, that's actually very thought provoking on its own right. Um, so I want to just tie it here to what we do at Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, other than being concerned, I mean, we are all very concerned, but <laughs> we, ad- we address real world issues, right? Like we have five major programs and they cover things like climate and environment, or sorry, climate and energy, food and environment, clean transportation, global security, uh, which is a big thing. Uh, that's nuclear weapons focus mm-hmm. largely. And then also Center for Science and Democracy. So we, we kind of actually are wrangling with things that are major topical issues in the expanse. Um, And so I'm just wondering, um, did you have at any point, did you have a roadmap of big issues that you needed to cover? I mean, aside from cancer (laughs) before you had this world just run its course. Not really. I, I mean, I, I needed something that allowed people to travel faster than can, modern conventional rockets would allow them to travel in the solar system because couldn't have every trip take five years. Um, so I, you know, you needed a much more efficient, much faster engine. Uh, so we just made one up. Um, and then, uh, the, the cancer thing, but you know, part of what we had to come up with or that I was started out coming up with for the, the original design is what is the reason people would be in all these places? Um, and you have to sort of accept the conceit that if humans can live someplace, they're going to. Um, because if you don't accept that conceit, then the world building of the expanse makes no <laughs> sense. There's no reason to go to any of those places. Um, so, you know, it's we're just sort of accepting that, like, people figure out a way to live on Ganymede, so they move there. Like, which, what, why would you ever do that? Nobody would ever do that. But, you know, no, if you accept would. the conceit that, yeah. I, I think they would move there for a minute and they'd go, this place sucks. And then they would come back. Um, <laughs> but, you know, once you accept that conceit, then then you have to come up with the reason. What are they doing on what what makes Ganymede unique in the solar system that people would use there? What makes uh, what's unique about the other moons? What's unique about the asteroid belt? What what things are there that if people moved there would become the thing that they do? So there was some of that that mapping we had to figure out. Um, the the. The other thing, though, you don't you don't really need a roadmap for the big issues. If you just start off with a uh, a status quo, which we did, and then 
um, a destabilizing influence, which we did. Um, all of those things come naturally from that. Questions about, you know, identity and um, resource allocation and food and um, war and governance. All it's all connected. It's all connected in human experience. And it's all connected in the world. So, if you're trying to think through, you know, with whatever level of rigor we were trying to think through, um, those issues um, present themselves along the way. You don't need a roadmap. It just happens. I, I actually love this because when people think of space and, you know, futuristic technology, I think it is very easy to let the humanity fall by the wayside. And I think that's the the common thread that is throughout this whole talk and is also reflected in your works is that humanity is it. I mean, we, we are, we are the thing we can count on uh, both good and bad. <laughs> I, one of my, one of my favorite lines, you know, Carl Sagan said a lot of amazing things, but one of my favorite lines he said is no one's coming to save us. We have to do it ourselves. And I, I just love that sentiment of we, we are going to have to figure it out. What, what, whatever stuff we're dealing with, it's nobody's going to figure it out for us. Uh, and if we don't figure it out, then it will stay broken. And um, I think people forget that sometimes. I think people are waiting for the parents to come, come fix everything for us. And we're kind of on our own here. Yeah, that, that's an excellent observation. I, uh, I did want to ask, and this, this is going to be a tiny bit spoilery. So for people who uh, haven't read or watched yet, maybe just turn your ears off for a moment. Uh, <laughs> um, but one of the things I actually found fascinating uh, is it, it tracks with the global security side of things. Um, right now, our big threat here on Earth is nuclear weapons. But the most devastating weapon that was used with intent uh, in the series, that the one that sticks with me the most, is when um, a group, and I won't say who, is throwing asteroids at the Earth. Um, and it is it's obliterating cities. I mean, it is it is more devastating, I think, than a nuclear weapon would be. Um, what sparked that brainwave that you could find weapons that aren't our nuclear mindset? Oh, I, I, I straight up stole that from Larry Niven. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, the, the Larry Niven and Jerry Parnell wrote a book called Footfall, um, where an alien species shows up to conquer the Earth. And uh, unlike other books of that type, they don't land and fight us with hand weapons. They just stay in orbit and drop rocks on us, which is absolutely what you would do. You know, if you're in space, you have the high ground. Why would you come down here and fight? There's, there's no reason to do that. You just drop rocks until we give up. And then once we've given up, then you come down and take the spoils. But, but it, it absolutely comes from there. And, and, and I remember reading an essay written by, it was either Larry Niven or Jerry Purnell, where he's talking about once you have space, once you've conquered space and can easily move matter around up there, um, you don't need nuclear weapons anymore. You can just push anvils out the airlock. And, I, and that always just stuck in my head, that idea of just something heavy, throw it, throw it at the ground. By the time it gets here, it is a nuclear bomb. Uh, and, and if you are low tech, uh, well, and then, and then another thing, uh, this, a steal from everybody, William Gibson said, when your enemy's high tech, come at him low tech. Um, and so, you know, you, you can't compete with Earth and Mars with attack ships and, and high tech weapons and all that. So you can't compete with them on that. They just have more money. Um, but what you can do is you can strap a little rocket motor to a big asteroid and just kind of point it in the right direction and fire up the motor, and eventually it turns into a devastating weapon that's almost impossible to stop. Yeah, I kind of like that one a lot too, because being a geologist, uh, I, I think <laughs> rocks are the solution, and you know, to everything. <laughs> um, yeah, we. Uh, I had a friend who we used to joke that when we were in the field doing research, we could think of 101 ways to kill people with a rock. Um, and so I think you added 100 and now there's 102. Um, although I, clearly it was, it was borrowed. I will say borrowed. You could say stolen. It's your work, but I'll say you borrowed it. No, no. Um, uh, no. Good, good writer steal. I, <laughs> I like the term in conversation. I think our work is in conversation with. Oh, <clears throat> Yeah, we, we just refer to things in science. We, we cite, you know, work cited page. That's how we get away with it. But um, okay, so now we have, uh, we have 
kind of run the gamut here of some pretty interesting stuff, but because we are the Union of Concerned Scientists, and as I mentioned previously, we are very concerned. So I ask all of our guests here on the show uh, one very specific question. So, uh, Ty Frank and Daniel Abraham, why are you concerned? Uh, honestly, my biggest concern right now is it's been 50 years, so the whole world has to start flirting with fascism again. And I don't get it. I don't know why every 50 to 70 years we all have to do the fascist thing again. But we're, we're in that cycle right now, and um, it seems to be worldwide. And I just hope I live long enough to see, it, see us come out the other side of this. But yeah, fascism is my concern. I, I'm, I'm going to go with um, the, the thing that, that I'm, I'm concerned about is um, how little we're able, we seem able to, to uh, generalize our experience from other organisms. Um, if you look at um, like yeast and how yeast, uh, you put yeast in a, a place and, and then it expands until it, eats all of the food and then it just dies off horribly. And then you look at um, how we're uh, doing as, as uh, monkeys on a rock. It, it seems like a very similar curve uh, and it doesn't seem like we're paying a lot of attention to that. We're, we're, we know that we need to stop using fossil fuels and we just haven't done it. And we know that we need to be sustainable about our agriculture. And we're just not doing it. Um, we're just, Working well, on it's the inconvenient. Yeah, yeah, well, it, and, and you know we don't want to. And um, I, I think um, our essential similarity to yeast will come out if we're not careful. <laughs> well, we do have a, a painfully non-symbiotic relationship with yeast. Uh, <laughs> as anyone who has ever had to take medicine uh, because of yeast infections can tell you. Oh, but, I got um, thrush mouth once. Ooh. And that is miserable. Ooh. Did that they solve that? Did you solve that in the expanse? <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't. But it, that is, that is, is, yes. Having a yeast infection where you don't, in, in a mucous membrane, not a pleasant thing. Yeah, avoid that. Yeah, I think we can all, that is one thing all of humanity can agree on. Um, <laughs> and then I actually had one more little question that just popped into my head before we go, um, mainly just because I'm curious about it. Um, what is it like seeing your written work translated to, uh, the, you know, the big screen? <laughs> it's weird. I mean, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like, um, it's like they're, it's like different versions of Batman. You ever, I mean, you got, you got, you got, um, like the Adam West Batman and you got Christopher Nolan's Batman and you got, uh, Alan Moore's Batman and, uh, they're all Batman, but they're just unrelated somehow too and it it's it's a weird um balance of uh similarity and unity and just not being the same thing at all i uh i like the casting i have to say i thought that they did a really good job with that um and oh my god kamina drummer like yeah, amazing boy. character Was amazing Kara casting awesome. like yeah yeah we, we all love Kara G. Jeez, yes. all of awesome. yes. Um, but no, it was, it's, it's been uh, quite a ride to go through your, the world you guys created. And um, I, for one, will be awaiting eagerly uh, what you produce in the future. Um, so thank you so much for being here and um, happy holidays to you too. And uh, to all of our listeners. 